The seventh word is found in the Gospel of John, chapter 19, verse 30. Here's how the Scripture reads. When he had received the drink, Jesus said, It is finished. And with that, he bowed his head and he gave up his spirit. It's very poetic language, isn't it? He says, it is finished. He bowed his head and he gave up his spirit. I would like to, as we consider this final word, to consider this is a triplet, these, these words, the poetic language, as a way of understanding the finality of what Jesus has accomplished on the cross. Allow me to share a, a quote by Dietrich Bonhoeffer, the, the German apologist and martyr. Bonhoeffer said this, he said, the cross is not the terrible end to an otherwise God-fearing and happy life. But it meets us at the beginning of our communion with Christ. It's not the end. It's the beginning. Let me ask you a question. Let's, let's put this and locate all that you're hearing tonight in your life. Where does your life begin? My guess is that's not a question that you think about very often. Where does your life begin? Is the starting place of your life, for instance, the pursuit of success? You know, power, riches. Is that the starting point? Is that, is that how you're operating? Whether knowingly or unknowingly? Or is the pursuit of success merely a means to a desired end that's different? The, the state of comfort. Where does your life begin? What's the start? Can you trace it? What is it that directs your life? What is it that informs ultimately the state of your soul? Be honest with yourself. I want to put before you that as we consider the final word of Jesus Christ, it is finished, that there is no other starting place. There's no other place to begin your life other than, apart from, the cross of Jesus Christ. There is no other beginning point. There is no other starting place. And so here the poetic imagery of John chapter 19, verse 30, when Jesus says, it is finished, he bows his head and he gives up his spirit. This expresses why our lives can have no other foundation. This expresses why there can be no other starting point other than the cross of Jesus Christ. Let's just look at those briefly. Each of those, those three statements connected together to the finality of what Jesus has accomplished. The first, it is finished. Jesus says it is finished. Is he saying it's over? That, that I'm done? That somehow I failed? I'm sure that at the time when Jesus spoke those words, that there were some that assumed that's what he meant. They didn't understand what he meant when he said, it is finished. Maybe they thought he was saying, I'm finished. No, he was fulfilling the scriptures. He was saying, it is complete. The, the Greek word, the Greek word that, that we derive, the three words, it is finished, is to telestai. To telestai. And, and that word uh, is one that's very interesting. You know, the prevailing language of the ancient world in the time of Jesus was Greek. And with that, it was, it was the language of commerce. Much like English is the worldwide language of commerce today. Greek was that language in those days. And, and whenever a final contract was drawn up, when the, when the execution of an agreement was set forth, a wax seal was placed on it, and a stamp, much like we would find today, expressed this, paid in full, 
accomplished fully. To telestai. To telestai. It is done. It is complete. It is accomplished and paid in full. Here's what Jesus is saying. He's saying that he had suffered. His blood had been shed. He is saying that he had taken on the sin of the world as the sacrificial lamb of God. He's saying that he has taken away successfully the sin of the world. That there was nothing left for him to accomplish at the cross. To telestai, paid in full, accomplished, complete, it is finished. Now consider the implications of such a broad sweeping statement. You know, every other religion, major religion of the world, stresses human achievement. Stresses the need for human effort to somehow build your way towards eternity. To somehow earn your way into the graces of the deity. But this is different. When Jesus says to tell us die, it is finished. It means that, that, that to suggest that there's anything that we need to add to what Jesus has accomplished is to deny the truth. To say that anything else needs to be added to what he has done is to lie. Is to fly in the face of what Jesus says as we consider tonight his final word. Jesus paid it all. And listen, we dare not, we dare not suggest he did not do enough. What else is there to add? What is there to add? What are you striving for? You know, some people will say, well, I give money to the church. They think about God. They think of the reality of who he is. and They think about how they can relate to them, to him. And they might say, well, I, I give to the church. As if somehow we can, we can pay our way into heaven. A lot of people say, well, I go to church. You ask them, are you a religious person? I go to church. I show up and I sit in a pew. And whether it's weekly or periodically, they might count that as a means to somehow adding something to what Jesus has done. Some people will say, well, I sang in the choir. Choir, no, no offense to you. You've done a wonderful job leading us tonight. But singing in the choir cannot add to what Jesus Christ has accomplished. It doesn't matter how beautifully you sing. It doesn't matter how many hours of rehearsal you put in. It will never, ever add to it is finished to tell us die. It is complete. It is paid in full. There are some out there who would say, well, hey, I, I have served in the middle school ministry of the church. Surely that, that counts for something. You're clapping your hands. You said, that's me. No, not even that. And by the way, we love our middle schoolers. Not even your service to the children or the middle school. There's nothing else. There's nothing else to add. There's nothing that can contribute to what Jesus has accomplished this is the reality of it is finished. It is finished means it is paid in full. It is complete. There is nothing more to add. It is an absolute statement of absolute power. I mean, consider this. At a place, where, you, at a time, in a moment, where you would expect a person to be powerless. Here Jesus is at the end of his life an inch before his final breath. And what, what happens on the cross, in a sense, nothing could be weaker than this. There's no moment that could be weaker than hanging on a cross. But what looked like weakness could not have been any stronger. It is finished is a statement of absolute power. And I want to tell you this tonight. It is finished to tell us die, tells you, tells us, that there is power in the cross. Jesus defeated the two most intimidating enemies you have ever known. He defeated your sin and he defeated the armies of Satan that are against you. 
It is finished. He bore your condemnation. He won the war against you. It is finished. Life begins at the cross. Where does your life begin? What's the starting point? It begins at the victory of Jesus Christ. So he says it is finished. That's the first of the poetic trio that we're looking at. But really related to that, Jesus, it is said, bowed his head. He said it is finished and he bowed his head. Some, this is unbelievable to me, some have actually suggested and wondered, was Jesus committing suicide on the cross? Was he giving up? Absolutely not. Of course not. Here's what Jesus said when he talks about bowing his head, when the scriptures speak of him bowing his head. The scriptures said this about Jesus, Jesus' his own words. He said, foxes have holes. He said, birds have nests. But he says, the Son of Man has nowhere to rest his head. Here Jesus is at the cross, a place where you wouldn't expect a person to find a place to rest their head. And at this dark, sinister, evil place that's been described by my brothers really well tonight, he finds a place to rest his head. He had no place to rest his head in his life, but here at the cross, he found that resting place. Now, this is interesting. This tells us, as you consider where does your life begin, that there is rest at the cross. There's rest, there's peace at the cross. Jesus bears all of our unbearable soul burdens and he gives us soul rest. That so we, we desperately need. We desperately need this rest. I believe this is what we deeply long for. In our souls, we're looking for rest for our souls. To be at peace. Jesus unbelievably takes an act of violence. And he brings peace out of it. The cross becomes a place of peace. He bowed his head. Jesus was at rest. He was at peace. Are you at peace? You will never, ever discover such peace, such rest in your life until you find the starting point. And the starting point is the cross, the place where it's finished. That's where you begin. John has already brilliantly talked about this. But I'll just mention it again along with him, drawing from what he said already. It also says in John 19.30 in this beautiful little triplet, it is finished, he bowed his head, and he gave up his spirit. Well, some will say, well, if it wasn't suicide, was it homicide? No, he wasn't murdered. His spirit wasn't taken from him, as John said. He didn't lose his spirit. No one took his life. He gave his act, his life as an act of generosity. This was an act of grace on the part of Jesus. He gave up his spirit. His last act. He made a choice. And Jesus gave himself to the world. Hmm. You talk about beautiful imagery. He gave up his spirit. He fulfilled John 3.16. That God so loved the world that He gave His one and only Son. Jesus says, I and the Father are one. And Jesus, as the curtain comes down on His earthly ministry, beautifully gives Himself to the world. And, and the amazing thing is that at the cross, the place of defeat actually becomes the place of victory. His purpose was fulfilled. And it makes the cross a place of hope. It makes the cross a hopeful place. This is why people paradoxically call the day that Jesus horribly died Good Friday. Isn't it interesting? Here we are detailing. In, in excruciating detail at times. Excruciating because it's so painful. 
to hear about the passion of Jesus Christ. And somehow we call this day good. It's a paradox, isn't it? I mean, we have on one hand the horrid imagery of all of this, and yet it's beautiful at the same time. Do you feel that? We, we, we see the tragedy in the fact that Jesus had to die for sins, and yet it's hopeful. And listen, because Jesus gave up His Spirit, there is hope for you. There is hope for you. It, it's interesting as we consider building our lives. So many people, you see them every day, wear crosses around their neck. Why, why do people wear crosses around their necks or in earrings in their ears or whatever it might be or, or, or emblazoned on their shirts? Why do people wear crosses 2,000 years later? Why do they decorate themselves with a, with a weapon of death? You know why? Because Jesus redefined the cross. He brought power. He brought peace. He brought purpose. And the purposes of God could not be thwarted through His death because as he came to the end of his life, the end of his, his time as a, as, a, as a man, a God-man on earth, his purpose was fulfilled. It is finished. And all of this, I want you to hear me, all of this is intended to be incredibly personal. This is not just something to sit back and observe. As if you were watching a play, or some kind of theater. All of this is intended to be personal to you. It's all intended to be foundational. Foundational truth on which a life is constructed. Where does your life begin? Where does it start for you? Life begins at the cross. There is no other starting point. I'll close with another quote. And I want you to hold on to this quote. Because it's going to bridge us into the next aspect of our time together in worship tonight. Here's the quote. This is by a wonderful woman, missionary, Elizabeth Elliot. And Elizabeth Elliot said this. She said, to be a follower of the crucified, capital C. To be a follower of the crucified means that sooner or later, a personal encounter with the cross must come. There's no other place to begin your life than at the cross of Jesus. Let's consider all this in prayer. Go in before the Lord right now. Please bow your heads with me. Mm. It is finished, Lord. Oh, dear Lord, Jesus Christ, Son of God, we praise you that upon the cross, you conquered the powers of sin and death. Hallelujah, Lord. We are forever in your debt. You who paid our debt in full. Thank you, Lord Jesus. So release us from all obligation, striving. So release us, God, from the penalty of sins that we have committed. By faith and the confirmation of Your Spirit upon us, we claim with You, Lord, it is finished, and the debt is paid in full. Oh, hallelujah, Lord. We praise You, Jesus, for so great a victory. Thank You, Father. Thank You, Jesus Christ. Oh, thank You, Spirit. We worship and praise you. We pray all this in the name of our Savior, the author and finisher of our faith, Jesus Christ. Amen. <laughs>